Uh, thank you everyone for joining us on this very special journey along the canal in Estrasalais with a very special friend, Carol Rosa. Thank you very much for agreeing to make this very special journey. It's very special for me to welcome you here because I know you as a special friend for so many years, but also because you are an extremely special friend for the Joseph Herman Art Foundation. We like to regard you actually as our ambassador. You have been in the past a former uh, trustee, but now at any time you will come to our rescue and help us out. You are indeed very well respected and we are very grateful. As I hope some people know you were born and brought up in a stricken life, although I know you've had a very exciting life and lived all over the world. And everywhere you've been, you have gained the respect, respect for your music, respect for art and for education. You are very much appreciated by us and I am really looking forward to making this journey as I am an Ostrogunas person and I also remember the very exciting journeys and you should reveal all that we have made on the canal. Right, so you're going to um, join me on a walk today and it's a walk um, that's about today and about the past as I remembered the uh, canal, or the canal bank as we used to call it. Um, now the canal is a very a long journey, a long canal. It went from a place called Abercrab up in the Swansea Valley and it went all the way down to Swansea carrying coals and etc. on barges which were drawn by horses. But of course I have to hone in and just uh, work on an area. I can't go all the way from Abergrave to uh, Swansea. So I have um, honed in on two places that we both, we all in Australia called the Sked. And we all know what the Sked was in those days. So up on the top of the area I'm going to work on, there was the Anderskedwin Colliery at the top of Australia and my father was a coal miner there for most of his life. And we called it the Sked. And then further down the village, there was an inn called the Anderskedwin Arms, and it's still there today. And so we call that the Sked as well. So we're going to go on that journey, and I shall go back and forth and up and down the various streets that are on the way along the canal. And of course, the, there was a, the canal and the canal bank, and people always walked along the canal bank on Sundays especially, and other days which I shall tell you about. So I'm going to begin our journey here, which is the, an old photograph of the Unscheduled Colliery. And I'm very grateful to Tim Burrell for allowing me to use this photograph in my talk. And we're going to begin from this colliery, which is just the other side of the road, uh, the Brecon Road. And I, I'm taking some slides to show you exactly where we are going. So right on the top of the stairway here, right the other side of the road was that colliery. It's no longer there, there's now a Welsh school there. And in my day when we walked and played around this area, this area used to be covered in bluebells. And every time the bluebells came out, I came up here to gather a bunch of bluebells for my mother. But today I haven't seen one bluebell there, sadly. Anyway, we're coming down the steps and we're going down along and we're going across the bridge which goes across the River Tower. And there, there's the bridge across there. And either side of the bridge, as we stand, there is the River Tower. One side of the bridge and the other side of the bridge. And this road, that road there, continues down across this field to this gate. And when I was a child, the open gate was not there then. But the gate is a kissing gate. And that field, and all along the canal bank in those days, there was no light. It was pitch dark, pitch dark at night. And so you had lots of courting couples coming up here and uh, going and co courting in the field there. I also was one of those victims, but we won't go into that story. Um, now here is the 
Old Canal Bank, a beautiful, beautiful uh, picture by T.J. Davis, uh, our local photographer, who was given uh, his daughters give me a kind permission to show this mm -hmm. image. And um, where the kissing gate is, it's right at this point, right up there. And so I'm going to be coming down this way and going back up it now and again. But just to show you how lovely it was to walk along there in those days. This spot here is called the Ruddy Dock. We call it the Ruddy Dock. And I've often tried to say, why is it called the Ruddy Dock? Well, underneath here we have the River Gears going into the River Tower, which is the other side of the field. And I think at that time when I was a child, we all spoke Welsh. It was only Welsh in the advice. And I think when people heard aqueduct and viaduct, in thinking in Welsh, it was a thought of a strange word. And when you think of the word and play around with it, um, you'll realise it's aqueduct, viaduct, radidoc. I think that's where the word has come from. I, I mean, if someone can correct me there, I'd be very glad to know. But um, this picture then is a, a lovely image of that time. And we're, oh, and let me go back a moment, because I want you to remember this particular house, this one here. Because in those days, he had this, there was a long garden as well, and the man who, who lived there, I'll tell you about him in a moment, but I just want you to see the level of the canal bank and the level of his garden. And now, now you see it today. So, his house is still there, there it is as it looks today. But if you see, this is the old road, and this is the new road. So this one was much lower, but now they've risen it for various reasons, I suppose. And the man who lived in that house was called Jack Garach, Jack the Ark. Why Jack the Ark? I have no idea. And he was a great character. And outside his house, against his hedge, there was a big gate, and it was a tall gate at one time, when the canal was in, in force, when the barges went up and down. So, I move along. Uh, these, this is my mother and father in that same spot again without the snow, looking across, either standing near the Rally Dock and looking up. And you can't see people in the further at the back there walking because it was a favourite walk of people on uh, Sunday, mark, Sunday afternoons especially. And I many times remember going with my parents up there all the way up to Kalan where there was a, 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 a nice uh, pub called the castle. And so this is the same spot again and the reason why I show this image is because I want you to see this field here. Um, it, it was a field that you couldn't um, build on at that time because it was a flood plain and the council wouldn't allow anybody to build on that field. And it was called Car Sammy, Sammy's Field. And we as children sometimes could play and then play football and things like that. Because they used to have rugby posts there at one time as well. So we could play in there and imagine we were playing uh, rugby. Um, this photograph is taken by a, a famous, a well-known London photographer who worked for the Observer called uh, Michael Pito. And he wanted to take rural scenes and he was a friend of Joseph Herman's. And Joseph Herman said, go and speak to Di and Nancy Roberts, my parents and they'll be able to help you. So this is uh, uh, Michael Pito's uh, photograph. Now, this is this field again, Car Sammy as we call it. And now the council all of a sudden have granted permission for people to build houses on there. So I don't know what's happening about the floodplain now. But you have the mighty Tower River down there, and that floods all of it. It's an, an extremely strong and frightening river when it's in flood. And as you see, this is where the, the uh, canal bank used to be. Now, we had lovely little bridges in my childhood. There were all these lovely stone bridges, and they, there were three of them along our journey where we are going today. But this was the Cumbia Bridge, and there are steps here along the side there, and underneath the bridge, lots of courting couples went on Saturday night to have a little kissing session and a cuddle. Um, and the, uh, the bus used to go over there, the bus used to come from Leith, all the way to Cumbiers, and then back again. And it was a lovely bridge. And here you see some people on the steps of the bridge. And this is a long vision to show you the bridge was right at the end of the canal bank there. And this is the old bus 
coming across the bridge on its way to Cogia from Nive. I don't know who painted this. I have done some research, but I can't find any name. We've even taken the picture out of the frame and had a look to see if there's a signature, but there isn't one. Uh, so if anyone does know who did paint it, please let me know, because I would like to pay uh, homage to that person. So the bridge is no longer there, it's been removed, and this is what it looks like today. Quite, in my opinion, quite clinical, quite boring actually. Um, and then we move on in the same area again. And this is what it looks like now. We have traffic lights here, and we have Eddie Shingen's shop still up there, but of course it's empty now. It was a great character in the area, and he was the father of Ed Thomas, the, uh, the man, guy who writes dramas and things for television. So uh, this is where the canal was, and now I find that quite boring and ugly, but then that's my opinion. And I'm sure other people felt the same way when the bridge went. It took part of our lovely community away. The homeliness of the place. Now it's cold. So we're going back again now on the canal bank. <coughs> and here is, this is my mother and my father, and this down here is the first wife of Joseph Herman called Catriona. Catriona MacLeod, she was from the Isle of Skye in Scotland, she was an heiress, um, and I particularly have taken this part of this photograph. This was by Michael Pito again, by the way, and these cottages here, there's a row of cottages here, one is slightly back from the other one, like this, and uh, my parents bought a little cottage in this row here, and my father had it... Um, redesigned by an architect and I just want you to see what that row look, looked like when we were children and this was a house that my father bought and then he was building it with a cigarette in his mouth <laughs> and this is what the house looks like today and this is what it was called when they built it, it was called a Tosca because my mother was a, a great fan of opera, she loved Tosca, the opera Tosca and she was a member of the local uh, Grand Opera Group. And this is what the row co Crown Cottages is called today. And our house is right behind there. But it looks really nice and modern and clean now compared to how it used to look like when it was coal, coal mining area, full of dust, full of dark colours and no bright colours at all. And there was certainly no white anywhere. So now we come to the, to the street where I was brought up, Oldfiddle Street, and we are at the bottom of Oldfiddle Street looking up, so we've got the River Tower here, and we've got the canal bank at the top there. In our day, there were no cars in the road, and so we were able to play hopscotch in the, in the road, we used to be able to play marbles in the dirt, and we used to play up there on the grind. And if you look at this building here on the right, that used to be a shop, and it was called Duffy's Shop. And um, my mother never bought anything in there because she didn't think that the shop was clean enough. Then we had another little shop here, which was a little sweet shop called Shop Jim. And I'm going to go up the top of the road now and show you another piece of interesting history about our street. Before we go there, I just want you to see it. it's called Ordinary Street. And now Duffy's shop has been removed and we have this little sitting area here for people. So a lot of the character has gone out of the street, actually. Now we're on the top of the street. And I'd like you to try to remember this corner and that corner there. Because in this corner, there used to be a little uh, lean-to type of shop. And the man who owned it was called Billy Yeast. Because in the little shop, we only sold yeast because people made their own bread in those days. And on the other side of the street, was that little building there, well that little building wasn't there, but there was a little haberdashery shop there, and they sold the most exquisite buttons and things like that there. And when they were closing down, I begged my mother, I was only a little, little girl, I begged my mother to go and buy all the buttons in the shop, and she did go buy quite a lot for me, and I played with them in the garden, and I'm sure if they dug up the garden where I was brought up, they'd find some of these lovely buttons. Now, we're going down this 
uh, old Canal Bank Way, just a little way, because there was a cemetery there at one time when I was a child. And it had a huge, huge wall and a big, big iron gate, and no one could go in there. It was locked. It belonged to the church. Um, and what they have done is, the I think the council did it, they cleared it all up because it was full of this Japanese weed that you get anywhere today. Um, and they took the gravestones up and put them along the side. But I think it's a much neglected area now, judging by the photographs I recently took of it, which I find quite depressing, really, that people can't respect something like this. So I'm going back to our street then, off the street, and this is the house where I was brought up. It didn't look like that at all when I was a child because the whole street was full of coal mining families and they were all rented houses and they certainly didn't look like this and the landlords never did anything to improve our living standards. Uh, they wouldn't have passed the health and safety test today. But this is the house, that's where I, my bedroom was. This is where my room was with my piano in it which I had to practice every day for an hour before I could go out to play. And this is the house on the right hand side, it's a very memorable place because it's a little cottage and that's the first place that Joseph Herman and his wife came to stay in the Stugan Life. And the family that lived in that house was Di Alec and his wife Peggy. Opposite our house, there was this big, big stone house with a big fence, a big gate in front of it. And Inside the house was this beautiful holly tree and every Christmas I would go to the house and knock on the door and ask for Harris. Harris was the man who lived in the house with his sister and his brother. And Harris would uh, ask if I could speak to Harris please and he would carry his name and Dick Harris. Uh, I used to say, and I was about three and a half and four, four years old and I used to say, Dick, can I have some branches of holly for Christmas, please, for me to put in the house? And he'd say, yes. How many do you want? So I'd say, about three or four branches. And so he would cut them and I'd have a nice little bunch to come home, take across the road and decorate the house with the holly. So when I was there three weeks ago taking photographs, I was delighted to see that the holly tree was still there. I was actually through to it. So we're back on our road again, our street, on from the street. Um, it's quite um, uh, an emotional thing for me to look at at the moment because in this spot here is where I met my husband and he was from Germany and he, uh, a group of students had come from Germany to make friends with a, group, a youth club group in the Stricken Life. And at the bottom of the Stricken Life is the River Tower. We always played down here, we swam in here always during holidays in the summer. I used to dive and jump into this pool and when we were children there were no trees like this. Trees didn't have a chance to grow anyway because we were all so lively there. Um, and there was a big stone, stone bank which the river threw up, especially in flood times. So this is quite alien to me now to see all these trees and bushes and things growing everywhere. They weren't there. All right, the, the Japanese weed was there, yes, but we used them as pea shooters. So we're going along the river now and we're going down towards that building on the right there that looks rather a yellowy colour. And here we're continuing down this road, Trudiga Road, and there's the Vartek Mountain at the background. I was born right at the foot of that mountain down in Castellavera. And the reason why I take this shot is because we are looking at a chapel and a pub, which is typically Wales, and the pub is no longer there as a pub because it's now called the Butcher's Cottage. It was the Butcher's Arms when I was a child. And when I got married, on the night of our marriage, we all went, a group of us, down the pub. We had a good old sing song, a couple of pipes, and we were all as happy as Larry. But today it's called the Butcher's Cottage, and that's in Pelican Street. As we go along, we see this new bridge. Now we saw a lovely little humpback bridge here called the Teddy Bear Bridge. But the flood of the river used to bring down trees and therefore it used to flood all around the area. So the, the bridge was removed and they put this new bridge there. 
I brought this picture in because it shows you that last year the flood was so enormous it took down the wall here which threatened that house and it, it, the water went into houses on this side and it took all the wall away and therefore they've reinforced it with all these things now. This bridge is also important in which I shall tell you in a moment. So you can't drive, you, you couldn't drive over there anymore but in the old days the, the buses and cars all went over the little teddy bear bridge. So I'm standing on the bridge now but looking in the in, in, further down the river, there are those stones that reinforce that, the new wall here to keep the flood away from the houses. And if you see right in the corner there behind this house is a little house tucked away, that is where Joseph Herman lived and his wife Catriona. Because really it was Catriona who, who built, who had that house built. I'll tell you more about that in a moment. So uh, Joseph Herman was fascinated with this seen here and I must just point out this building here is the Penavant Inn which is where Joseph and Catriona first lived in and stricken life in, uh, on the next floor up which is called the ballroom they lived there. But Joseph liked this scene and this is what he painted. That's his version, his imagination of that scene. Right. We are on the top of Pelican Street now, and where this pile is there, there used to be another little stone half-backed bridge. And uh, we used to, I'm going to take another slide now. This is what it looks like today, but when we were children, the bridge was here, there was a big lock there, and we used to cross the bridge, go through that gap there, and go up into those woods which we call a patch and we played there all day till four o'clock when we all needed something to eat and then we went home again. But it was a very pretty bridge. There was a big, big lock there as well. Not, not functioning of course. So we've gone down the road a little bit further and now we're coming to another street. So there were three streets along where we've been walking. Orfinger Street, Pelican Street and now we come down this little little gully here as we call it, into a street that was called Goff Buildings when I was a child, but now they call it the rest of the And we're going to go down here and we come into what I call Goff Buildings. And Catriona did a beautiful painting of this street. And she sat right here and I watched her painting it. And a lot of people, it was for sale quite a while ago, and people were selling it as a, as a Joseph Herman painting. And I said, no, it's not a Joseph Herman painting. It's Catriona who did that painting. Um, and I said, I watched Catriona paint it. She sat on a little stool there with her easel. So uh, this is also an interesting street. Lots of changes here. Um, and I should take it down there. So I, this is my parents again. These are my parents again on the canal bank, but right down here, Catriona was standing, that's why they're looking and smiling at her. But I've blown Catriona's photograph up for you to see uh, what a lovely lady she was. She was very pretty, very attractive. She only had one lung, but she could move furniture like a, like a bulldozer. Um, it just horrified my mother often. So uh, we're going down the street, and Catriona bought an old pop factory in Goff Buildings. And she had an architect, architect design a new house for them because Catriona was an heiress and she had the money. Um, Joseph didn't have much money, but Catriona had the money to have this house built. And uh, that is the plan. And I'm grateful to Betty Ray Watkins for allowing me to use this uh, sketch of, or plan, I should say, the architect plan of the house. So that part of the house faces the garden. This part of the house is where you come in off the street to go into the house. There, in this little patch here, is a, 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 gold, a, a, a little pond. And Katria asked my father if he would build a, a pond. And my father said, well, that's what a, a pond for. When well, she said, I want to have water lilies in there and some fish. So he built the pond and apparently I'm told that the pond is still there. So anyway. This part of the house, all this area, 
was Joseph Herman's studio. I spent many, many hours of my childhood and teenage years in that studio. So watched Joseph paint. Uh, I used to go in there as well. My past here, Katrina had gone away for a holiday, and I'd go in there, wander around on the proviso that I wasn't to touch anything, um, but I could look. Uh, I loved the smell of the oil and the, and the linseed oil and, and the turpentine, and oh, it was just lovely to see everything, uh, which I think had a tremendous impact on me and an influence on my life um, in the world of art. Anyway, opposite here was is that little house now, but in those days there was a miner's pub there, the miner's pub, which was called. And further up, there was another pub called the Star, and little Maggie, we called her Maggie Bach, Maggie Bach Star, she ran it, and I think it was just a little pub in her, in her front room. But she was a feisty woman who didn't quarrel with Maggie. Further down the road of Gothville Lakes is this lovely memorial park set for a well-known uh, um, uh, man called uh, Dr. Daniel Preveron, he was a musician and a very fine composer. And uh, the canal bank would be at the top there, you see, that's where the canal would have been, or here as we say. Now we're coming to the back of the, of the street, of back of Gough Village. If you can imagine, this was all canal and bank there, not the road like you see now. But I put this in because there's a very important building right on the end there, which I shall now explain to you. What you must remember as well, there were no lamps or lights in those days. The canal back was pitch dark. And this is the house right at the end. And this was a house that we went and coached in on Saturday nights or after the dance or after the cinema to have a, a little kiss and a kettle or a snog, as they say these days. But um, I've taken this closer, which is the corner of the house there, because that's where we coached and cuddled. And um, it's today, the, the road is much higher than what it was in our day. As you can see, we're looking down, there's the wall, and we're looking down, but it was, it was as level with the canal bank um, in those days. So you could walk up there and coach in the corner. If those walls could speak, I dread to think what they could say, or what they would say. And now we come to the end, practically the end of our journey, and this is of the, what we call the old square in the strip. There is a square further up, but this is the old square. It was often called Red Square at one time, because this is Uncle Jim's shop, as we call it, the little blue building there, but it certainly didn't look anything like that when Uncle Jim had the shop. There was certainly no other high roof like that. There's the Jim mounted behind, but red, uh, in the square, every Guy Fawkes night, there was a huge bonfire, which all the children from Offbridges had piled stuff as the years went by there. And on a bonfire night, us young people would gather here and throw fireworks at each other. They're quite harmless, really. <coughs> Pardon me. And so the reason why it's called Red Square, a lot of the coal miners at that time, of course, were, were really left-wingers. And uh, we called it Red Square, like, because it was like communism. And so they would meet in a shops shop sometimes and have a talk about uh, their beliefs live. So we're coming to the end of our trip and we're going down this little pathway here, this is staircase, which didn't look quite as lovely as that when I was a child. There weren't so many lovely steps. I think the railings must be still the same ones, I'm not sure. Um, and we are coming to the end of our journey. So there's the, the back of the uh, Eliskedrin Arms. And here is the Eliskedrin Arms. At the moment, of course, it's closed because it's of Covid, uh, but uh, they, that's the end of my journey, the sked, as we call it. And there we are at the end of the journey. <coughs> Yeah, well, thank you for such a, a warm, warm talk, for such warmth and for such respect for our heritage.
Yes. You're proud. Yes, sir. I must confess that I was a little emotional. I think it's because of the quoting I must have done. You know, memories of quoting another canal bank. Thank you for helping me revive them and remember <laughs> them. And please don't go far, Karen. I'm sure the Sagadja, the foundation, Joseph Ellen Foundation, will want you to do far more. Do you have a mind? Do you have a mind? And please, I, I must now, of course, apologise to uh, those watching on Zoom. We've had some terrible internet problems. But the full talk is available on Facebook and will soon be available on our YouTube channel. Do you have a